Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study tonight. Let's all stand and sing page number 369. Follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Everywhere he leads me I would follow, follow on. Walking in his footsteps till the crown be won. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me I would follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. Where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Danger cannot frighten me if my Lord is near. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow. and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather, sing praises to you, worship you, but also bring our requests and our burdens to you. I pray you use pastor as he preaches. I pray for the message. I pray for our corporate prayer time as we gather and, and talk to you and bring our needs to you. I pray you give us a good service. Please have your hand on it. And I pray that it would be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue singing page 309. What a friend we have in Jesus. So faithful, good. 
Grace singing. You may have a seat. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that, brother. And Miss Grace, it's always good to have Miss Grace home with us. Uh, this day in Baptist history, as, uh, as in our day, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there of what Baptists are, what Baptists believe, and how Baptists practice their faith. Um, this, is, this has been going on for centuries. In Germany in the 1600s, there were a group who believed they could just, now that they're saved, they could just live any old way they wanted. They could lie, cheat, steal, or whatever, because it didn't matter, because they're going to heaven no matter what. And um, they were lumped in with the Anabaptists. Uh, in response to this misconception, the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay Colony wrote a letter to the Plymouth Colony asking them to enact new laws restricting Baptist evangelism and Baptist congregations. On, a, on this day, October 18, 1649, the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony cited a baptismal service where 14 adults were saved and then baptized near Plymouth and called upon them to um, stop this uh, evangelist, stop this quote-unquote heresy and, um, and to enact new laws to rid the colony of Baptists. Well, due to the sufferings of our forefathers, America has religious liberty. We have always been stood for the, the for uh, against uh, the idea of church or a state church, and um, and so we should not be surprised though that the lost of this world do not understand what a Bible believing Christian is or how a Bible believing Christian acts, and so um, we need to continue to live our faith, sanctified, temperate lives, uh, so that people can see we're truly free in Christ, and the gospel has made a difference. In uh, Peter and John's day, in Acts chapter 12, the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem was under persecution as well. James had been killed, Peter was in prison, and the church had gone to prayer. And in Acts 12, 5, the Bible says the prayer was made without ceasing to the church of God. You know, when, when nothing can be humanly done, I'm telling you, it's the perfect time to pray. Unfortunately, the tendency is, is to find some sort of a man-made solution, and I'm just as prone to pencil whip an idea together instead of going to the Lord. In Acts 12, 5, it says, prayer without ceasing, that an effort began that night when Peter was arrested, and they were going to pray and not stop until either he was dead or he was free, and we know from from the Bible, he was freed miraculously. You know, when, when things just don't seem possible, there's still a God in heaven who's waiting for us to get over ourselves and our own intellect and go to him and go, hey, I need you. And tonight, I want to ask you to pray with me tonight. God is doing great things in and through our church, and it just isn't possible physically in our own doing. But God has got great things in store. Maybe tonight you're facing something that just doesn't seem possible, like a boss that's unreasonable or a system that's flawed and, and stacked against you. There's still a God sitting on the throne waiting for us to get over our own selves and call upon him and see what he can do and would do because we chose him rather than a credit card or chose him rather than trying to manipulate from behind the scenes, if we would just choose him. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand and pray with me as we seek the Lord tonight. Whatever your need is tonight, God is waiting, and God is excited to hear from you. Our Heavenly Father, I love you.
Our Father and our God, we do love you. And Father, there is no way this church could have survived this long without your grace and your power. And Father, I look expectantly to the future. I pray, God, you would build a legacy of faith, grace, and evangelism here in this hilltop that would be a beacon to many generations to come. Father, do that which only you can do. Provide, but also guide so that we'll know we're stepping by faith in every moment of every day. Bless the families of this church, Father. Grow them. Father, that each marriage would grow stronger. Each child would be drawn to you. And Father, that from this, this place, this wonderful church, we would see men and women and boys and girls come, up, come to your service and surrender, give their lives to serve you and to see your kingdom expanded in all directions. And Father, with great expectation, we look to you to fulfill your promises. And we, we know they're already done. And we say thank you. And we're excited to see as it arrives. Bless now as we continue in our song service, as we prepare our hearts. And Father, may your word touch us and grow us. In Christ's name, amen. Brother Ben, won't you lead us in another song, please? <laughs> Join me in singing page number 289, We Have an Anchor. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold, their swing of strife. When the strong tides bend and the cables strain, will your Enjoy the church this morning. Thank you. Turn it well. For that. All right. The Calvinist in me says, thank God that's over. All right. <laughs> Where's my phone? Who took my, oh, it's in there. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Grace, for playing though. 
Sister, it's always good having you here. It just is. Praise God. We love grace. I... No, no, I'm good to go, brother. I'm good to go. Thank you. I, if there's a problem, I'll, I, my watch will tell me, but we're good. We're good. We're good. Oh, oh, I remember. I, when I got here, you were eight years old. I remember that. You tried. I saw her get saved. I saw Austin get saved. And uh, just a tremendous legacy of faith in that family. And that is my prayer for all of the families that come to our church, is a legacy of faith. Now, I've been preaching through um, just practical messages on Wednesday night. Just how do you live your faith? And I, if you've not had a chance to catch them all, I would encourage you to go back and watch them, not because I'm so great, but because the Bible is so clear on how to apply it to your life daily. If nothing else, watch the message on dealing with anger or watch the message on forgiveness because those are tough ones. And then how to get back on track when life throws you a curve. We do, Brother Ben and I were doing the string thing and that worked out. And um, How many of you took me up on my challenge and watched the Sunday morning message after you got home. Oh, you haven't done that yet. Okay. All right. Now listen, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to be real serious now. All right. I'm not just preaching. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to be real serious. The reason is the devil doesn't want you to. Now that can sound sensational and that can sound foolish, but either the Bible's real or we're wasting our time. So if the battle is raging like the Bible says it's raging, there is a reason why you've been busy thinking of other things rather than thinking about, I probably ought to listen to that message again. See, it's about influence. The devil, (laughs) your thoughts come from three places. The thoughts you thought you thought may not be the thoughts you actually thought you thought you thought. You need to rewind that one, all right? The devil plays Mary Hobb with your mind. Take your Bibles, turn to Philippians 4. I want you to have victory in your thought life. I want you to understand that the battleground for the Christian is in your mind. All sin begins in our heart. You didn't just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to jump into adultery. You didn't just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to get into porn. You didn't wake up one day and decide, I'm just going to be angry all the time. No, all sin starts in our heart. And the influence that the demonic, or look, we'll just be honest, Satan took one-third of the angels with him. He took an angels at every single echelon of leadership and authority in God's kingdom. He took one-third of them with him. Now, I have my personal opinions. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But I believe, just like Daniel was told by the messenger angel, that the battle rages for influence. That the thoughts you and I get in our heads, we have to decide, did they come from God? Did they come from the pizza last night? Or did they come from his majesty, Satan, who is the God of this world? And all of his legions and all of his echelons of power, they're they're angels. (coughs) And they're not the little cute ones like the ones you have in your garden that look like babies and, oh, no, no. They are powerful, intelligent creatures. And, and, and it was funny, I, I, ironic, when, when, when I went to give the illustration, I snapped my fingers and I said, the thought you just had to go to the bathroom did not come from God. The thought you had of let's get to the restaurant did not come from God. So by process of elimination, where did it come from? So, I challenge you, watch the 11 o'clock service for this reason. You will see all the, you will see things or hear things that you missed. And you're going to, I need you to ask yourself, why did I miss that when I was sitting in the pew? And he was spitting all over the front pew. Why, you know what I mean? You know, I was slinging the blessing down. Why did I miss it? Because I'm telling you, You can't see the unseen realm. And some of you brought your angel with you today who's your guardian angel, and some of you brought one that's been on your trail and your family's trail for a long time that doesn't belong to God anymore. And the battle is in your mind. It's where he fights you. 
And I'm not talking about the, the modern hocus pocus garbage you hear in pop psychology. I'm talking to you today about the battle that rages for influence in your life. Philippians chapter number four and verse six, be careful for nothing. When you realize how big God is and how powerful God is, when, when you see him, when, like I, I've never saw, I haven't seen God like Isaiah saw God, but when I imagine God like Isaiah actually saw him, all of my problems start to fall into really low categories. Like, you know, God's aware, God's on top of this. It's not that God doesn't care because my problems are small. It's because God's already got it under control. He's so big. He's got it under control. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So, I mean, we, we are told how to think. Jump back to verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We are to think with praise. And then we're to think with poise. Look at this. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. You are to think. You are to be composed in your thoughts. Why? Because you, the reason we're moderate, the reason we don't go off to one side of the other is because we know who we're serving. We know he's in charge. We know he's got this. I just need to be obedient and faithful. Other than that, this is all up to him to handle. Verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Think with praise, think with poise, think with prayer. It's not that we enjoy worrying, it's that we desire control. And it is a foolish, foolish, childish desire. You really don't have control of nothing except the choice you make. That's it. You don't have a choice, or excuse me, you don't have a control of anything in this world except what you choose to do. That's it. You can't choose how things react, how people react, how governments react. You can't control who's on the other end of the phone. You can't control what their computer says or does not say at any moment of any given day. You can't control none of it. All you can control is you. So think with poise, praise, and prayer. Verse 7. And the peace of God, think with peace. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, how am I supposed to keep that peace, preacher? I mean, have you seen my schedule? Man, if I could just share my calendar with you, could you honestly think? I could think with peace. Yes, verse 8 tells us how. Verse 8 tells you how to be at peace when the world is falling apart. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So let's read that verse backwards. I'm to think on these things. I am to intentionally, on purpose, choose my thoughts. And what am I supposed to choose, preacher? Well, I'm to choose that which has virtue and, and, and is praiseworthy to God, that is of a good report, that is lovely, that is pure, that is just, that is honest, that are true. Think. Think with purity. And then think with purpose. These things. These things. Which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. And see, that is the result of peace. Now, in the Bible, you have this section of Scripture, and then you have 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. So let's jump over there real quick. There is another facet to this intentionality of our thought life that we need to grapple with. Now, look here at chapter 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 5. Casting down. Look at that now. Casting. He, that is a command from God to you. Casting down imaginations. Do you see that in verse 5? And every high thing. What are we talking about? We're talking about imaginations. Well, that, where does imaginations happen? They don't happen in your foot. They don't happen in your knee. They don't happen in your posterior. They happen in your brain. Right? 
right? Come on, let's be honest, right? We got to think. We're talking about thinking. Time out. Note, let me step over here for a second. The world thinks you Christians don't think that you've checked your brains at the door. Why would you bother coming on a Wednesday night on such a beautiful evening and sit here and listen to me sling snot and breathe fire and, you know, preach like a nut? The world thinks you're crazy anyway, right? Okay, so we've got to be intentional about our thought life. We're going to have victory because that's where the battle rages. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge. Where does knowledge happen? Doesn't happen in your foot. Doesn't happen in your knee. Happens in your mind. See, we're still talking about thoughts. Knowledge of God. Anything that exalts itself, any thought that comes in your head and, 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 and disparages the knowledge you know of God and bringing into captivity every thought. See, we're still thinking about thoughts here to the obedience of Christ. Now, these are the two classic references when it comes to thought life. And, and, and I'm just gonna ask you kind of a silly question. Have you ever thought about your thought life and how it affects your fellowship with God? How it affects your relationships, humanly speaking? Because when the Holy Spirit is grieved by our thought life, he's not working very well. He's not really prone to get active in our relationships. The Bible has a lot to say about our thought life. The battleground is here. Satan works on your mind. He knows if he can control you, your mind, and what you think, he can control your life. Now, do you believe that to be true? Have you met a teenager lately? <laughs> Have you met a public schooler, somebody who went through public school in the last five years who is now a voting adult? Have you ever tried to have a conversation with these people? How'd they get that way? They didn't just fall off the truck one day and go, this is how I believe. I believe that all of this is, everything we know to be scientifically true is no longer actually true or relevant. And you just look at them like, oh my gosh, are, have you had your meds today? Honey, are you okay? I mean, that's, that's the first thing that comes to my mind is compassion. And you think, you think, how horrible. Well then, why do they think gender's fluid? Where did that, who wrote that? By the way, the woman who created gender studies and created all this craziness got saved. She wrote a book called An Unlikely Convert. She got saved. She was the chair at Syracuse University. And she wrote all this crazy gay, lesbian stuff that, 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 that's been going on for the last two decades. She wrote it. And then she got saved. That's just... So where did it all come from? It didn't come from God's influence. So by process of elimination... I know it sounds hateful when I say it a lot of times, but I don't mean to be. I, I want you to understand there's a battle that's raging. And I can't save every pup in the pound, but I can help you with your life and your marriage and your kids. That's what I can help you with. You have to understand the, the severity of this topic of your thought life. In Proverbs 23, 7, the Bible says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you want to turn over to Proverbs 23, Solomon is trying to make a point to his son who won't have him around when he's king. And he is going to have to grapple with his thought life. He's going to have to grapple with what he thinks when he sits on the throne. And he won't have his father there to help him. Verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Verse 12, Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Verse 15, my son, if thy heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. All of this is dealing with the way you think and what you decide to think about. So what is correct thinking? Wow, if you had a microphone and you could walk around downtown Alexandria and ask, what is correct thinking? 
How, how do I learn what correct thinking is and, and, and what kind of thinking does God actually want me to think about? At salvation, we enter into this spiritual battle. Many times I hear, I, I, I talk to Christian wives whose husbands have allowed their thinking to be unrestrained and uh, even in the ministry, I've had uh, young couples that, whose husband was an assistant pastor and she picks up his cell phone and it's a text from a woman she doesn't know and she opens it and, and by the way, gentlemen, your wife ought to have the password to your phone. Amen. Wow, just Jim and I. Okay, amen. Your wife ought to have access. Well, you don't understand. I carry a phone that, that, that what? You think the White House is going to call you tonight? There's only one or two people in this room that actually could get a call from the White House. The rest of you guys, no, not happening. And you can't fix what's going on overseas with a phone call, all right? You just can't. So your wife needs to have access to your phone, okay? And, and, and if you don't believe me, I'm not looking at you. I'm not looking at anybody. But if you don't like that, there's a problem already, and I love you, and I'm here to help you. My wife picks up my phone and says, listen, I need, why don't you give so-and-so a call? I said, well, you got it. Just open it up. You got my cell, you got my number. You got my, you know what my pen is. We're on the same Facebook page. You know why? Because I don't care where my ex-girlfriends are. And I want my wife to know. Phil has all my passwords, by the way. Yeah, because there's, there don't need to be, I shouldn't be looking at anything. Right? Man, just Jim and I on this deal. Okay? <laughs> hey, huh? I love you, but the battle is in your mind. She picked up that cell phone. She saw things. Of course, he was all repentant and sorry. But within a month, he'd run off, left her. He had committed what I call emotional adultery. Porn. Yeah, you think, well, porn. Yeah, porn's terrible. Talking to some other person of the opposite sex, uh, uh, you don't need to be doing that. If, if, if I call a lady in this church or I text a lady in church, it's only because my wife's not available and I need to know now and it's kind of important or you've asked me a question and I need to get back to you. Like, what does this need to look like or how this needs to happen so before we order it and it's correct. And, but I need you to know my wife has access to everything and and I tell her, why don't you look? Why don't you do that? Why? Because the battle is here. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Because what goes in your eyes and your ears sinks down into your heart and marinates. See, all sin starts in our heart. We think about it first. Then it comes out our hands and our feet. And our mouth. So what are we to think? What are we thinking about today? And what, are we, and what we think about today is going to determine what we think about and do and who we are tomorrow. What you think today determines who you are tomorrow. In Galatians 6, you know the verse that says that we, are, you know, we reap what we sow, but let's take that a step farther. I'm very greatly burdened about the children that we serve here at this church and love at this church and, and what is coming in their eyes and ears, however subtle? How can, I, how can I teach them to control their thought life? The scary thing is we fool ourselves into thinking nobody else knows what we think. Yes, there is. There is someone else who knows what you think. And that's the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter number 11 and verse 5, if you're taking notes, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11 is before Daniel. You should have a well-worn path in Daniel from our preaching on Sunday morning. <laughs> My Bible just kind of opens up to it. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 5, the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. We are out of fellowship with God and we don't understand why spiritual things are happening. We go to church, we read our Bible, we pray, and we have this uncontrolled thought life and we're doing it mechanically like we're checking a box, but there is no power there because we grieve the Holy Spirit by what we think. 
well, I don't agree with so-and-so because they're just kind of a free-range parent who does whatever they want to. They let them kids do whatever they want to. Bless God, I would not never do that. It's in your place to judge how other people parent. You don't walk a mile in their shoes. What you need to do is pray for them and love them. You don't have their kids, and thank God you don't have mine. Praise the Lord, you'd be thankful you didn't have my monkeys. And I don't walk a mile in your shoes. It's not my place to judge you on how you parent. It's my job to come alongside and go, listen, I love you. I'm confused, you're confused. Let's try. We're at least confused together. Let's do what we can to help each other. But we're doing it mechanically because we're, we're thinking terrible things about each other. And, and you, think, you think, well, no, no, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. Or you'd hang out with them. We have to teach this at home. The Bible says in Romans 13, 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, make not provision for the flesh, flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You heard Jesus say that if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you committed adultery in your heart. I mean, he didn't lower the standards. He raised the standards. And, and when, we, when we fail in this area, we give the devil a place to fight us. We give him a place to, to work on us. And in the Bible, the heart and the mind are basically interchangeable, like we read in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. So how do I bring every thought into the captivity of Christ? Well, number one, you've got to take control of your eyes and your ears. You have to. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. It's not that which goes in. It's that which comes out of here. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. I had a, an aunt. Her name was Betty B. Betty B. Sims. And Betty B. spent the majority of her life in Louisville, Kentucky. And she had a southern accent that was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And she'd say, she, she, and I didn't have kids while she was alive, but she would tell my older sibling, she'd say, well, if it's in their heart to do, They'll do it. They won't do anything that's not in their heart to do. And she is right. Why'd you do that? It was in their heart to do. You, you ask them, what were you thinking? And what do they say? I don't know. It was in their heart to do. How did it get there? Now, we can blame the public school all we want to, but there's other places too. There's other ways. Where it hurts, and this is where the wounds come, is when maybe it's a sibling, your sibling and their kids. Let them see things they shouldn't have or do things they shouldn't have. My son's all tasted alcohol at my brother's house because we don't have it, mine. And you think to yourself, how horrible. Well, to them, it didn't matter. To my, my siblings, they were trying to be mean. We all tasted it at 10. I mean, that was just kind of a rite of passage, you know? And you think, well, that's just dumb. No, that's culture. They weren't doing it to be malicious or stab me in the back. This is the way we were raised. You have to take charge of what goes in your eyes and ears. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, the imaginations. Now, we're talking about fantasies. Every person who rebels in their life, it's because they're living in a fantasy. They're living in a, they're living in a, reality, they don't, a reality that's not real. I mean, their, their view of God is wrong. Now, in Ezekiel 8, God referred to your fantasy mind as the chambers of your imagery. That's in Ezekiel 8, 12. They imagine things. And God says that that is where the problems happen. And in, tech, in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we are to pull down those strongholds of thought, those areas of our life that rise up against what we know to be true and to be pure. Now, Paul said we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Remember that from Sunday? It is the influence of our flesh, the world, and the devil and his angels. We have, we have the armor of God in Ephesians 6. That's true. We'll talk about that another day. But you and I, what if someone could know what we were thinking? What if what was up here in our little, you know, video player in our head were made public? How humiliating. How Would it be humiliating? Would it be crushing to your spouse as you muse about the one that got away? Would it crush your spouse when you have suicidal thoughts and you play with those thoughts? 
They didn't come from God. Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Well, I was wounded or I have an injury, and that's true. It happens. Many of our veterans are injured. Uh, but, but where did those thoughts come from? You got to recognize it. Because otherwise you're just living out there on your own without any plan and you wonder why the world kind of takes a beat. You take a beating from what goes on around you. So if you have an uncontrolled thought life, it, it leads to the fulfilling of unholy desires. So let's, we have to transform our mind. Take your Bible, go to Romans 12. I'm gonna show you how to transform your mind, yes, but I want you to see that this is what we're called to do. And this is every person, every Christian's battle. This isn't just guys. And by the way, it never shuts off. I don't know, I don't know how it's like for girls, but it, it doesn't get any less the older I get. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Your mind is part of it. Holy, acceptable unto God. Is your mind holy? Is your body holy? Which is your reasonable service? God's not asking anything. He doesn't have the right to ask. And be not conformed to this world. Man, there's a whole thinking out there that this world has that is contrary to Scripture. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Did you notice he didn't say hit the gym? By the renewing of your physical workout. No, it's all good. Gym's great. You ought to go to the gym. I ought to go to the gym. You know what I'm saying? And we're talking about it. We're in the talking phase right now about Pastor Mix hitting the gym. We're just having that talk. We're not, we're not there to commit yet. You know what I'm saying? Not ready to commit. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I remove, re renew my mind? All right, let's get into it. All right. Number one, you need to have a real intimate Real, intimate, personal, passionate relationship with God. Amen. It can't be a box you check. Christianity is not an accessory you add to your life. You cannot trick out your life, as we call tricking out a car. You cannot trick out your car and upgrade your car by Christianity. That's not how we do it. It's a complete overhaul from the inside out. First Chronicles 28 and verse 9. Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Know him. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts. He's going to know what you're thinking anyway. And understandeth all imaginations of thoughts. He's going to know what you're fantasizing about. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, now this is a guy who turned his back on God and lived for the world, you know, wine, women, and song for like three or four decades. And finally, at the end of his life, got his head screwed on right and realized what a mess he'd made of life and the world and wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. So don't get a lot of theology out of Ecclesiastes because it's a bitter old man who lived his life for the flesh as a fool. It says here, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. In John 8, Jesus said, know him and continue in his word and you'll be a disciple. You've got to meditate on this word. You can't just read it. You've got to think about it. You've got to dig into and, and dive into its depths and meditate on it, memorize it so that you can think about it throughout your day. We need to stop and think about the things we read in the word of God. Number two, you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit of God as he prompts you as you're reading. He'll bring up things. If you've been thinking dirty, evil thoughts, then ask God to forgive you. Look at what God is saying about those things. Memorize those verses. I mean, Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I think upon a maid? Why would I do that? Why would I dishonor God? Joseph said, how could I sin against my Lord by sleeping with Potiphar's wife? I don't even want to look at her. I don't even want to be in the same room with her. You know, we have a news feed on Facebook and Twitter, and you just kind of swipe. And, you know, there's, there's every now and again somebody will post something that says, I'm just seeing how many people will swipe by text and rather, when there's no picture, you know, blah, 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 you know. Are you actually reading, blah, blah, blah. Your mind works that way. 
My preacher always said that if a bird lands on your head, it's not a sin. But if you let him stay there and build a nest, now it's your fault. Stuff pops in your head all the time. Swipe it away. Right? I mean, the minute you click on something, you're pulling it down to your feed and you're giving it authority and the algorithm is going to... I clicked on a 77 Firebird and now Mrs. Mix is getting muscle cars. All these muscle cars. <laughs> I also clicked on a Basset Hound. They had these little puppies with the big droop ears. Now we're getting like puppy crack. I mean, it's just puppies all the time. People are going, do you want a puppy? Do you want to buy a puppy? And they're just like... Basset hounds, basset hounds, basset hounds. Right? Your mind works that way. Those people down at the church don't like me. Don't you, don't you grab that and bring that down and give it authority in your life. Swipe that aside. Swipe that aside. Pops in your head, why don't I just end it? This is foolish. I, I, I've got no future. I don't, why don't I just end it? Swipe it aside. Don't. Give it authority. Don't feed it into your algorithm. Don't click on it and allow things to just keep. The de Once the devil finds where you're at and, let, and the things you like to muse upon, he'll keep feeding it to you. You got to swipe that aside. The, like I said, the bird lands on your head, knock it off. The thought comes in your head, knock it off. Swipe it away, cast down. That's what 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. I, I don't want to think on that. No, I'm not going to think on that. It kind of reboots your mind when you think about it. You're like, I'm not going to think on that. I'm going to think on something that's praiseworthy. Uh, what is it? I, you know, when I'm, I'm, I'm having these thoughts, I think to myself, what is it I can praise the Lord for today? What am I happy about? What am I thankful for? You got to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 17. You have to be controlled. You got to let Him be in control. Now, we love people who have self-control. We do, right? We do. We like it when people control their, their... But the truth is, as Christians, we need to be under spirit control. Holy Spirit control. I don't trust your flesh to do it. Number three, remove yourself from the temptation. Remove it. Unfriend those people. Thank you. I mean it, guys. Some old girlfriend or some other person you went to school with or college with or you deployed with and she's got, she's got her booty picture on Instagram unfollow unfollow stop getting that stop it you don't need those thoughts in your head it's not going to help you walk with god it's not going to help you love your wife get that garbage off your head don't just cut that off well we've been friends since and it's true my wife asked me the other day why is this woman clicking on your feed and, and liking your your sermons who is this person well we've been friends since i'm five years old i met her on the day to kindergarten well, why does she like your stuff? I don't I have no idea because she's not a Baptist. I don't have no idea. But praise the Lord, she's listening to the reels and the sermons. My wife's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay. There's a company out there called Covenant Eyes. CovenantEyes.net. There's also ClearInter.net, which are um, things you need to put on your devices. Number four, remember that God is all you need. He's all you need including your thought life, that our life, our thought life should glorify God. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You must be content with his presence and discontented with your sin. Amen. Gentlemen, that means go home and love your spouse more than you love yourself. Choose to be affectionate. Choose to speak their love language. Pray for your spouse. Ask God to give you love you don't have. See, the Bible says, Isaiah 64, 6, that all of our righteousness says, that means the best I can produce, is filthy rags. Right? It's garbage. The best love I have for my wife is garbage compared to God's love. So I go to God and I say, God, I've prayed this throughout our marriage. God, give me eyes only for her. God, give me love that I don't have. Give me more than I can handle. Give, let me love her and her alone. Father, show me how to love my wife like you love my wife. 
Father, let me love her like you do. And, and Father, help me to, to love her beyond myself with a love like you love her. Let me see her like you see her, God, in glory and, and, and when grace has done its perfection and help her to see me that way. And, and Father, please. Look, if you're not praying for your marriage, you can't expect pastor and the deacon to do it. We can't fix it. You've got to be praying for your marriage. Then you need to read Ephesians 4 over and over and over again. Ephesians 4 is the change chapter. It is the chapter that breaks chains and addictions. It's the chapter where you put on Christ and you put off the flesh and you make conscious decisions. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think on this. And I, I am, I am going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to intentionally try, love. <laughs> you say try. <laughs> you intentionally don't. Why? Because it doesn't come naturally. Did you notice the Bible doesn't say wives love your husbands? Did you know that? Because they do that naturally. They love to love. If you put them in a vice and squeeze them, love pours out their pores. <laughs> Guys, not so much. It's not natural. Ladies, it's not natural. We have to, we have to do it intentionally. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive for us. You think, what, 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 <laughs> don't, don't, don't you love me? Yes, I love you. But, but you need me to, to love you in a way that's beyond a guy does. That's why homosexuality is for cowards. It's easy to be married to somebody who's just like you, who likes everything you like and doesn't care if you talk to them all day. You got a point? You say, well, that's just a silly joke. No, it's true. Gentlemen, you need to love your wives and then you need to go to God and get more. And you need to lavish it upon them every single day. You need to make it a priority in your life. Number two, you need to make it a priority to teach your kids how to control their thought life, what goes in their eyes and ears, and what they think. And you need to call them on it. When they start to get angry, when they start to, to say hateful things about other people, you need to call them on and go, whoa, 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 that person belongs to God. How dare you be hateful? I mean, my wife would say that all the time, boys like to hit each other. Anybody else have boys in the house? Like to hit each other. And so my, my wife would pull those boys aside and say, wait a minute, that boy belongs to me. What are you doing hitting my son? Well, I'm your son too. And he, yes, but you don't have the right to hit him. You don't have the right to hate him. Blood is thicker than plastic. Blood is thicker than water. That's what we would say. I'm convinced that the lack of spiritual power in our lives stems not only from our prayer life, but the lack of spiritual power stems from our thought life. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, did you think about true things today or did you dwell on things that aren't? Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. Now, you expected me to say that. Did you think about pure things? What would your spouse think if she saw a recording of your thoughts? What would your boss think? What would your friends think? How humiliating would your coworker think if, you, if, if, if that person saw what you thought of them today? Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue in those thoughts, if there be any praise, that means to actively, purposely, intentionally think on these things. You can have victory. As you think, that is what Solomon said you'd be. And what you think today is who you will be tomorrow. Amen. And if we, don't, if we don't grab a hold of this concept, then what hope is there for our relationships, for our families, for our, for, for our fulfilling our purpose? You know, um, there's something that's not in my notes, but I feel the Lord leading me to say it. What music do you listen to? Amen. I know every word to every Journey song that was ever written. I know the words to every ACD song that was ever written. It's ingrained in my body. I, I, just, I can just hear one chord and my mind just... Boom, boom, boom. I won't do it because it'll be like the song that never ends. You'll have it in your head. But it's true. So what are you listening to? What's going in those ears as you're riding to work? Is it the frustrated stupidity and bias of the news media? I'm, I, I, I quit listening to the news. I only get one vote. That's the only way, that's only the way I can, that in prayer is the only way I can affect what's going on everywhere else. 
There's no point in me carrying that garbage with me all day long. All right? Number two, the music you listen to affects you, and you're a fool if you don't think that. You're a fool. You're a fool. You need to bring in music that inspires your soul, focuses it on God. Amen. Now, Mrs. I'll, I'll tell you my sin. I listen to, I will listen to love songs from the, from the Rat Pack because they make me think of Mrs. Mix. And I sing them to her. I sing them to her. I really do. Now, don't you tell her this. It's a secret. I found a book. I found a book on why I love you. And it gives me all the different reasons why I, to love my wife. And I use them. I, I'll say, boy, I love you. And she'll say, why? Because you're gentle with my tender parts. I say stuff like that. I'll say, you're, you're gentle with my heart. Don't you tell her I said that. This is my secret. And no, you cannot borrow it. But you need to find a book that inspires you to express your love. Is there a woman on the planet who wouldn't appreciate a man expressing their loves once in a while in a unique way other than, yeah, you know, we're tight, right? <laughs> See, it's intentional. And it goes that way with God. To get up in the morning and say, God, good morning. <laughs> oh, I'm so thankful that I can talk to you right now. I found myself telling the Lord how thankful I was today that I could walk and talk and think. Sometimes God will put somebody in your life who can't do those things to remind you of things to be thankful for, who can't string two thoughts together. You ought to thank God for that. There are single people who would trade with you. There are broken people who would trade with you. There are, there are just people who would trade with you in a heartbeat. And we have so much to be thankful for. If we'll think on these things, if we'll listen to music that focuses us on, the, on God and his goodness and inspires our soul, you'd be shocked what an effect that would have on your office just because it had an effect on you. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I could go all night on this, but it's a blessing when you grasp onto this. But I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, you're about to get into the fight of your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're about to enter into a battle which you're ill-equipped to handle, and the devil's going to fight you. The world is going to fight you. And so is <laughs> your flesh. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're about to enter a battle. If you commit to thinking on the things of God, your flesh will fight you. Weird stuff will pop in your head. Your mind will wander and you'll think to yourself, what was I thinking that for? Because your flesh hates God. It does. You have to be intentional. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, we can because you've told us we can. You've commanded us to do so, so thus we are able to be intentional in our thought life. You commanded it. You've told us what to think upon. And now, Father, the choice is ours. And God, in the next few moments, we not only bring our sin to you and ask for forgiveness, we're also going to come to you to now, Father, and we need your spirit to guide us into the, to the areas of our fantasies and images in our mind that need to be renewed images and thoughts and musings that are not holy that need to be removed and overwritten and father i recognize that our brothers and sisters in this room do very difficult things all day long in very difficult situations with very imperfect information and they do the best they can to make the right decisions as they consult our government. I pray, Father, that you would help them to differentiate from the difficult things they have to think about from the things that they have to think about during the day and when they get home. Father, give them grace, give them mercy, give them peace, give them comfort. Father, for I believe their integrity speaks for itself, and I praise you for these people. But Father, each one of us has an area of our life that needs to be brought into focus.
by your spirit and your word. And as we honestly come before you, Father, we bring it to you for direction and correction. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Brother Phil begins to play the music, this is your opportunity to go to God and just say, Lord, I'm bringing my thought life to you now. If there's something astray or amiss, I'm asking you to bring it into focus that I may confess it and repent and seek you for renewal. Our Father and our God, we love you. And Father, we make, we, we, I'm not trying to make light of the topic, but Father, we need you. We need you, Father, to renew our minds, to renew it for thy glory. Father, that we're thinking your thoughts, that you're able to operate more freely through us without restriction from our flesh. And God, may you do a work in our lives that can only be, answered by someone saying, look what God has done. Bless us now as we continue in our service in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. you may look this way. October 21st, which is Saturday. We're going to be at Belvedere. Bring a chair, bring some s'mores or some hot dog material or whatever you like, whatever hot dog-esque, meat-esque, whatever you're eating right now, bring it. We're going to have skewers. We're going to have fun. And then uh, October 22nd, this Sunday, coming up, is Family and Baby Day. This is where you're going to have an opportunity to dedicate your children to the Lord. What does that do? That doesn't save them. That doesn't guarantee anything. That, that is us, as a sign of worship, recognizing that our children come from God and that we, to the best of our ability, are committing to our Savior uh, to, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we, as a church, are surrounding each other, going, I'm going to help you. I'm going to be a good example. I'm going to live right in front of them so that they have another example saying the same things they're hearing from their parents. October 28th is a teen activity at King's Dominion. Uh, Trunk or Treat is October 29th. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have a bonfire fellowship here the first Wednesday night in November. A military appreciation day will be the 5th. Um, if you're not sure, a lot of people are starting to ask, how do I give to the church? We do have a, a, a plate back there. We also have the offering box built into the door. Thanks, Brother Mike Duncan, who did that. It's perfect. But you can also give online, text to give, or you can give online at kingstownbaptist.org. And so you definitely, as the Lord leads you, it's a sign of worship as you do it. Um, go ahead and do that. And then, of course, men, you need to sign up for the men's prayer advance in January. And ladies, in March, we're going. I already got our hotel rooms. We're set. It's going to be good. All right, let's be dismissed in prayer. Father, we love you. It's a joy to be in your house. Uh, it's a privilege to be in front of your people. I, I pray, Father, that you would continue to speak to our hearts and minds as we leave this place. Father, as the frustration and anger mounts due to the circumstances we live in, help us to remember that you're in charge and that we are well inside your care and in your hand and under your eyesight. You've not forgotten about us. And Father, we have nothing to be frustrated about or angry about. We have you. 
which is so much more than we deserve, which, is, and which, which Father, we just praise you for. Help us, Father, not to allow our minds to wander into the areas. And when it does, Father, help us to come back through the conviction of the Spirit. And Father, help us to intentionally, intentionally feed our heart with the things of you. And Father, may it come out of us through our hands and our feet and our mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.